kind introduction. Actually, the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies is closely related to transhumanist thinking. And what I'm going to be presenting to, to you today are some of the central challenges related to transhumanism. Transhumanism, according to Francis Fukuyama, who is a very famous conservative cultural critic in, in the United States, it's the world's most dangerous idea. And I'm going to be presenting a Nietzschean version of the transhumanism. And Nietzsche, you know, is, is also dynamite, so it's really dangerous thinking. We are in an age where paradigm shifts occur in many fields of the life world. The coming about of the post-human perspective is particularly relevant in this context. It is related to three following insights. A move from a dualist to a non-dualist anthropology, a radical increase of anthropotechniques with the power of enhancing human capacities so that the likelihood of the post coming about of the post-human can be increased. That's actually one of the definitions of transhumanism. It's associated with an affirmation of technologies in order to increase the likelihood of the coming about of the post-human. The post-human can come about by means of digital technologies or with the help of biotechnologies, whereby the field of genetics is particularly relevant. These three basic insights lead to a massive bunch of intellectual, social, political, ethical, and economic challenges. Here I will present a selection of emerging questions, and by means of the fireworks of intellectual stimuli, I will present suggestions how they can be addressed in an appropriate manner. You may not agree with me concerning all of the solutions which I'll present, but you have to realize the incredible relevance of the related questions. Taking the stance that these developments should not occur and demanding that these technologies should not get used is not a realistic option. If these technologies do not get developed in our country or in your country, these events will occur in another country. If scientists and engineers do not get permission to make research in one country, they will create permanent dwellings at sea outside of the realms of governmental and national governments. Oil platforms and flo floating islands are particularly relevant for that purpose. The, U the US presidential candidate of the newly founded Transhumanist Party, Sultan Istvan has published a novel entitled The Transhumanist Wager in 2013, in which he plays around with the uh, possibilities of seasteading. That's actually the term of what that refers to, finding such a platform outside of the realm of national governments. It is worth reading the novel, not because I agree with all the ideas which he presents, but because it broadens, broadens your horizons concerning a great multiplicity of ways how the future can be shaped. The following fireworks of stimuli will reveal some of the most relevant issues with which we will have to deal with today and in the not so distant future. So firstly, I will start with a non-dualist understanding of human beings. Zarathustra from Iran might have been the Persia might have been the first who has created a rigid distinction between good and evil. This categorical distinction in most philosophies, it goes along with a categorical, dualist, ontological distinction, in particular with the understanding that all human beings consist of an immaterial soul, consciousness or mind, and a material body. It's this insight which has been dominant in, in Western philosophies, at least since Plato's thinking, who clearly separates the realm of forms which we can access by means of thinking from the sensual realm in which we live. This basic insight was accepted by most Western philosophers. Each one adapted it to her or his own understanding. According to both Plato as well as the Stoics, all human beings have a rational soul. However, for the Stoics, this is the reason why all human beings ought to be considered morally too, as morally equals, which was not the case from Plato's perspective. Descartes agrees with the Stoic insight of human beings possessing a rational soul. However, he holds that only human beings have any type of soul. Animals consist of matter only, according to his perspective. 
The Stoics and Plato, on the other hand, claim that there are further types of souls which animals and plants possess. So in many respects, Kant, who is incredibly important for shaping the outlook um, and many constitutions in, in, in Europe, agrees with Descartes' understanding of animals and human beings. But Kant uses his insights for developing a complex ethics on this basis, an ethics which is still widely taken for granted today. It is even the intellectual basis of the German foundational law, which is founded upon the concept of human dignity, a concept which can only be fully understood when having a grasp of, the, of Kant's ethics. Only human beings have dignity. Animals, plants, and stones ought to be treated like things. That's still the valid position in Germany and in many other countries on a legal basis. They all fall, fall under the object law. It's this distinction between subjects and objects, or in moral terms, between things and persons, which has its intellectual root in a dualist anthropology, which has been dominant in Western countries, at least since Plato onwards. It also has significant practical implications, from the prohibition of peep shows via the prohibition to shoot down hijacked planes that fly into nuclear power stations to the moral status of animals and how animals can be treated when making experiments. So it's got significant uh, implications for the life of it. However, this anthropology has become less and less plausible from the end of the 19th century onwards, due to insights put forward by Darwin, Nietzsche, and Freud. We no longer regard ourselves as being categorically separate from this world concerning our ontological status. We no longer hold that we have a material body and an immaterial soul. It's a more modest way of thinking, as it moves away from the traditional hubris of possessing a categorically special status in this world. This doesn't mean that we do not possess special qualities. Learning a human language might merely be possible for human beings. However, animals also have such qualities. Vampire bats. They manage to detect blood by means of infrared sensors. It is their special capacity. Animals too can have special capacities. Moving away from the traditional anthropology implies that it's no longer plausible that only human beings participate in the immaterial realm and consequently are being attributed personhood. Whereas all other beings are seen in things or objects, even though this is still the qualification which is legally valid in Germany and in many other countries today. I'm not claiming that we ought to replace the dualist anthropology with a non-dualist one concerning the legal realm, because in this way we would replace one fundamentalist view with another one, whereby both are not being shared by all citizens. However, this insight leads to my suggestion that such strong anthropologies and ontological positions should not be a part of liberal democracies, because they are in conflict with the great plurality of worldviews which we can find in all liberal democracies today. It's this shift which is of fundamental relevance for all the other developments about which I'll be talking. Seeing ourselves merely as gradually separate from all other animals implies that in the same way as they have come about on the basis of evolutionary uh, processes, this also applies to us. In the same way as all other species of animals can die out, this insight also applies to us if we do not adapt ourselves in the appropriate manner. If we do not adapt ourselves to the permanently changing environment, we will die out. But if we do so, we will, if we do so, we will develop further via transhumans or the further developed humans toward the post-human members of a new species, if we are lucky. This is one reason why technology is of immense relevance for us today, but it's by far not the only reason for using technologies. Second, personhood for animals, robots, and artificial intelligence. One of the implications of the revised understanding of human beings, which I've just described, is the relevance of moving away from speciesism. Peter Singer was right when he explained that attributing personhood solely and exclusively to human beings implies speciesism. Moral recognition should depend on morally relevant capacities and not solely on someone's belonging to a specific species. 
I'm not embracing Singer's counter suggestion as it's not regarded as plausible by most enlightened people. However, it presents a move into the right direction. Personally, I suggest that an interplay between three pillars, widely shared moral intuitions, the latest scientific insights, and the recognition of the relevance of, moral, of negative freedom should provide us with a basis for evaluating the moral status of any type of entity. In addition, the cultural embeddedness needs to be taken into consideration. My approach is a narrative and hermeneutic one, which stresses the relevance of discourse plus recognition of the relevance of the just mentioned three pillars. This position takes into consideration that social situation and moral evaluations are permanently subject to change, and that it can be the case that such changes are relevant for the legal evaluation of entities. In addition, it's a procedural solution which doesn't aim for a perfect state and solution because it recognizes the relevance of movement and change in the field of morality. This position can also integrate new developments like the option of creating hybrids. The UK, for example, permitted to create chimeras consisting of animals and humans. If they're being destroyed within the initial two weeks, after their realization. However, they, why should they have to get destroyed? We lack a basis for evaluating the moral status of these hybrid entities. They do not go against human dignity, as these entities are no human beings. The potential of these beings can be enormous. Dutch scientists, for example, have already managed to genetically engineer zebra fishes such that they can use photosynthesis for nourishment purposes. The fishes turn slightly creed, cream as part of this process, but it works. Genetically, zebra fishes are not so different from human beings. Maybe the little cream human beings from Mars are actually our future. Furthermore, it needs to be considered that we are hybrids already. On, on our skin and in our intestines, there's an enormous amount of bacteria and other microbes. The human body consists of more non-human cells than of human cells, and we, we couldn't survive without these cells. This insight can be particularly relevant for the future of xenotransplantation, the transplantation from organs from animals to humans. Martin Rosblatt, who is a transgender transhumanist, owns a pig farm for genetically engineering pigs such that their lungs can be transplanted into human beings without the risk of them being rejected. It seems to be a promising attempt. She is particularly interested in it because her daughter is suffering from a life-threatening lung disease. However, the move away from attributing a categorically special status solely to human beings can also imply that given the appropriate developments, it can be the case, that we will have to attribute personhood to computers or artificial intelligence. Researchers are already trying to check whether consciousness is a phenomenon which is based upon the complexity of neuronal structures by attempting to imitate the complexity of a cat's brain using one computer per neuron. However, it might be that consciousness is not even needed for gaining a special moral status. How should we treat a computer with super intelligence? Three, the dissolution of the moral prohibition to treat a person merely as a thing, as both personhood as well as thinghood no longer exist in their traditional form. The person-thing distinction, which goes back to Kantian philosophy, has many general moral implications. One of them is the moral prohibition to treat a person merely as a thing. In Germany, this principle implies that peep shows are legally forbidden and it's forbidden to shoot down a hijacked plane which seems to fly directly into a nuclear power station, as long as there is one innocent being on board. In both cases, it would be the case that a person is being treated merely like an object. In the, in the case of the hijacked plane, the innocent pilot on board would die anyway, and a million people's lives could be saved if the plane was shut down. However, here the government would treat the innocent pilot merely like an object to save the lives of the million people on Earth. 
Such utilitarian calculations go against an ethics of human dignity and the traditional understanding of personhood which leads to the above mentioned moral prohibition. However, if the traditional person thing of distinction is no longer plausible, the moral prohibition is no longer applicable either. Hence, we need to find a new basis for moral principles, which is not an easy task because the tradi traditional understanding of personhood and thinghood are part of many legal constitutions that have highly significant implications for our life world. It's a task which we will need to deal with for morally shaping the future. The fourth point, the plura plurality of the good. Once we take this new anthropology seriously and we understand that all aspects of our existence participate in evolutionary processes, the following question needs to be asked anew. What can we say about living a good life? Some transhumanists suggest strong concepts of the good, like the validity of the Renaissance ideal. It might not be possible for all of us, but we really want to be intelligent, beautiful, strong, healthy, and have all the other strengths which are associated with the Renaissance ideal of human perfection. Other liberal or naturalist bioethicists like Julian, Hux, uh, Julian Zabolesko from the University of Oxford are more sympathetic with a common sense approach to the good life. You live a good life if you possess the following qualities. Firstly, not being disabled, whereby disability is seen as the context-dependent quality. Secondly, no disposition for mental illnesses, Thirdly, having good health. Fourthly, good capacities for communication, memory, and empathy, and finally, high intelligence. I do not regard these suggestions as plausible. As universal validity implies that it applies to all human beings at all times in all parts of the world. I, on the other hand, regard a radically pluralist account of the good life as most plausible. Only by listening to and acting in accord with someone's psychophysiological demands does a person become authentic. Consequently, the following acts can be understood as being based on authentic wishes. This doesn't have to be the case in all instances, but it can be the case. Person A wishing to die. Person B desiring to have her healthy legs removed. Person C, wishing to eat parts of himself. Person D, not wanting to be cured from manic depression. And person E, regarding his deafness as an advantage, but not as a disablement. The list of potential examples could easily be continued. If the Renaissance genius account or the common sense account of the good were universally valid, these wishes could not be accepted as authentic wishes but would have to be seen as expressions of an ill mind. I do not think that this has to be the case. By claiming that these wishes represent insane states of the mind, these persons are being treated paternalistically and violently. Their wishes are not recognized as their own. And others claim that they know better than oneself what is in one's own interest. I regard such a way of treating people as highly problematic because the otherness of someone else's wishes does not get appreciated appropriately. On the other hand, there are culturally dominant paradigms of leading a good life. On the uh, other hand, there are needs of one's own physio psychophysiology that do not necessarily correspond to these general demands. A pregnant woman who wishes to have sex with men other than the father of her child. A student who enjoys sexual intercourse with several people at the same time. And a young girl who is longing for erotic encounters with a woman 30 years her senior represents three examples in question. All of these desires do not get approval from culturally dominant paradigms of the good life. But there are people with such desires, and it's aggressive, violent, and paternalistic to approach them by claiming that they do not understand themselves in an appropriate manner because these types of acts do not correspond with the concept of the good life which the culture in question regards as true. Initially, it was difficult for me, too, to imagine that it can be the case that a deaf person is not disabled, but merely different. However, by recognizing the wide range of preferences, choices, tastes, and cultures in all parts of the world at various times, 
I came to realize how important it is to recognize that a different human being might regard different capacities as important and different shapes as, as attractive. This approach has implications for dealing with the concept of the family. The good example is the option of creating children with three biological parents. The UK is the first country worldwide which approved the technologies necessary for having such children. It's a very simple technology by means of which the nucleus of one female egg gets removed and it gets replaced with the nucleus of a different egg. In this way, the risk can be excluded that a mitochondrial genetic disease gets transferred from a mother to a child. The mitochondria are not in the nucleus, but in the cytoplasm which surrounds it. Afterwards, the new egg gets fertilized so that the child with three biological parents can come into existence. The UK has approved this procedure solely for mothers with this mitochondrial disease. However, it could also be a useful tool for a lesbian couple or two women and a man having a biologically related child. If three adults have a biologically related child in this way, why shouldn't they be allowed to marry? If this is what they want. Adults plus a biologically related child are the basic constituent for a legal family in most, most cultures. However, this example reveals the enormous social implication if post-human perspectives are being considered. The fifth point, self-overcoming and the good life. It is possible to also make claims which are valid for a great percentage of people. In this respect, the good health, the prolonged health span are widely shared qualities. Furthermore, it can be said that permanent self-overcoming is often associated with an increased fulfillment. The following thought example helps understanding this issue. Life as a child in a protected family is easier than life as a student. However, if you ask a student whether they would want to be a child again, most students would decline that offer. Because they value the cognitive capacities, intelligence and knowledge they now possess. <laughs> These goods are not solely positional goods, but they are also intrinsic goods, which people do not wish to give up again once they possess them. In the same way as children cannot imagine what it will be like being a student, students cannot imagine what it would be like being a posthuman. However, given this analogy applies, we have a reason to hope that once you are a posthuman, you wouldn't want to be a student anymore. The fifth point, autom autonomous self-overcoming and heteronormous self-overcoming. It's important to stress that the technologies which are being discussed shouldn't be used to legally force people to use them in a certain way. So we agree that it's a wonderful achievement living in a liberal and pluralist society. Consequently, there are two options for using emerging technologies. So firstly, by means of autom autonomous self-overcoming, I decide something for myself or by means of heteronormous self-overcoming, whereby the second option does not allow political and religious leaders of other institutions making a decision concerning who gets altered, but it refers to the very special parent-child relationship in which such decisions are necessary and useful. The sixth point, our silicon-based future versus our carbonate-based future. The technological domains which are particularly important at the moment and promise to continue being so are the silicon and carbonate based technologies, like gene technologies and IT technologies. In the first case, human beings can transcend themselves by developing capacities they've never had before, or maybe even increasing the likelihood of the coming about of a new species. In the second case, alterations concerning cyborg technologies and maybe even the option of mind uploading can be realized. I will focus now on each of these two domains. First on gene technologies. Even though philosophically the option of mind uploading cannot be excluded, I regard human processes to being more closely related to a continued carbonate-based existence, which is particularly related to genetic research. Gene creation by means of synthetic biology, gene modification, gene selection and gene analysis and big gene data are four highly relevant fields in this context. 
Synthetic biology is an attempt to create biologically useful systems, Craig Venter's research is particularly notable in this field. He has created a partially synthetic species for which he is trying to get a patent which raises the ethical question concerning gene patents. He also claims to have been the first to have created synthetic life. However, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues holds that it's not the case. A closely related field is that of biohacking, which refers to a movement of do-it-yourself at home biologists who conduct gene sequencing by means of easily accessible methods and technologies. Both fields are striving and it's worth getting further information about them just by Googling them. A separate but related and much more intensely discussed field is that of genetic modification. For the past 15 years, it has been the subject of intense ethical discussions. And most leading ethicists in the world have taken a stance within this debate. Most noteworthy from a bioconservative perspective is the analysis um, and position of Jürgen Habermas. He regards genetic modification for therapeutic purposes as morally legitimate, because in this case an all-purpose goal is being promoted. The use of genetic modifications for enhancement, for something which is better than normal, for enhancement purposes, on the other hand, is morally false, according to him, because in this case persons get treated merely like objects. He presented reasons for rejecting a powerful pro-enhancement argument which analyzes genetic enhancement and traditional education as structurally analogous processes. In both cases, so concerning the relationship with education and genetic enhancement, in both cases, parents are making decisions for their children. Habermas claims, however, that genetic modifications are always irreversible and educational modifications are always reversible. However, contemporary gene research, and in particular epigenetics, show that both premises are highly, highly implausible if, if not outright false. Consequently, there are strong reasons for claiming that genetic modifications and traditional education are structurally analogous processes. As structurally analogous processes also, also ought, ought to be treated morally analogously. The conclusion can be drawn that genetic as well as educational modifications can be both morally claimed as well as praiseworthy from which follows that genetic enhancement do not have to be morally objectionable. This was a very short summary of a, of a very detailed long argument I recently presented in the Journal of Evolution and Technology which is actually a journal worth checking out. It's, it's an online uh, journal which deals with all the ethical and anthropological issues of, of emerging technologies. Journal of Evolution and technology. It also needs to be noted that genetic modifications cannot yet be done on a day-to-day -day basis. However, scientific research shows that gene modifications can be undertaken and they can be successful without having to be, have any side effects. This reveals that it's merely a matter of further research to turn the technology into a reliable one. Another separate issue is that of gene selection. Here it has to be noted that it's already a reliable technology. It presupposes in vitro fertilization, which means that an egg is fertilized by means of a sperm within a petri dish. After several divisions of the fertilized egg, it is possible to take one fertilized egg and analyze it genetically. Thereby, a great variety of information can be found. For example, about the character, about the character traits, health information, as well as responsiveness to certain pharmacies. Then it can be decided whether the fertilized egg from which the cell was taken ought to be implanted into the womb or not. Several issues are being discussed in this context. What is the moral status of the fertilized egg? What is the status of the analyzed cell which gets destroyed? Is it moral to select a fertilized egg after IVF, in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD? Habermas responded in the same way as in the prior case. It is immoral because a person is being treated merely as an object which indicates it's an immoral procedure. However, he doesn't recognize that it doesn't have to be the case that fertilized eggs are identified with persons. For many people, a fertilized egg 
which consists of eight cells, is merely a lump of cells and should not be identified with a fully crowned human being. This position gets further support from the fact that seven out of our ten fertilized eggs, which come about by means of traditional procreation, are never being realized, but are flowing out together with a slightly stronger monthly period. In addition, it needs to be understood that selecting a fertilized egg and selecting a partner for procreative purposes are structurally analogous per processes. In the same way as a government should not interfere concerning once selecting a procreative partner, a government should not interfere when we wish to select a fertilized egg after IVF and PGD. Even more relevant than gene selection will be the case of gene analysis. Progress in this field is particularly noteworthy given the parallel creation of big gene data. Such an analysis can tell you how likely it is for you to get a certain disease. It can tell you something about your reaction to certain pharmacological products and it can describe some of your strengths and weaknesses. It's one of your interests. It's in your interest having had such an analysis. On the basis of such an analysis, you, you can change your life so that your life goals are being promoted by considering your genetic dispositions. The costs of such an analysis are permanently getting lower. <coughs> However, then the issue of bioprivacy comes in, or rather dissolvement of the concept of, your, of bioprivacy. The problem is already an explicit one. Let's consider the German legal system. It's already a legal obligation to give away the information of an already made gene analysis if you wish to take out an insurance with a high financial risk for the insurance company. Consequently, anyone considering the option of having such an insurance cannot realistically take the risk of having their genes being analyzed, even though it could be in their personal interest of having undergone such a gene analysis. However, it's not only you who is interested in the genetic information. Potential future employers, insurance companies, and your government could also be interested in this information. Once the data is available, it is digitally and hence publicly available because we have reasons for holding that anything which is digitally available and in the internet is no longer private information. Because it's already part of the internet panoptic. Still the challenge goes even further than that because you're sharing mental, many central aspects of your genetic data with many of your family members. Even if you are not willing to give away this information yourself, it is possible to get hold of the same data by asking your brother, with whom you might not have spoken for years. Furthermore, you also need to consider that by giving away your genetic data, because you wish to know better your own family tree, you are giving away information about your sister, too, even though she doesn't want this information to be out there. The question of bioprivacy represents significant further stepping stone concerning the future of technological developments. Here the realms of gene technology and computer technologies merge. We have big gene data which encloses important information um, is, is being revealed. And furthermore, cart cartographies of all your movements are being stored digitally by means of public surveillance um, plus facial recognition software once telephone traces and the GPS data of your in-car navigation systems. All three fields of data are digitally being stored and processed via the internet, which again turn all the information about you into publicly available data. All central aspects of your personality are revealed within the internet panopticon, in which citizens of all technologically advanced countries are imprisoned. It's a situation which is unpleasant and by means of which your behavior is being altered. Once you are fully aware of your situation, however, the solution to the situation is far from clear. Information technology. After having dealt with our carbonate-based future, I'm addressing some central issues concerning our silicon-based future. Cyborgs, AI. Cyborg enhancement, AI, superintelligence, and the danger of human extinction, mind uploading, and cryonics, and immortality are topics which most of people identify with post-human reflections. <coughs> I merely wish to highlight some specific insights which I regard as particularly noteworthy. 
One of the first topics which gets addressed when talking about transhumanism is that of immortality and mind uploading. As it's been shown in the Johnny Depp movie, Transcendence. I merely wish to point out that hoping for the possibility of having one's personality downloaded to a computer is not being affirmed by all transhumanists. Philosophically, the option of mind uploading cannot be excluded, but there are many serious challenges related to it. I suggest to let us wait and see how far mind uploading can be realized technically. What is important for me is that it's not an option for gaining immortality. Whoever advertises such a thought does not have to be taken seriously. Immortality in the sense of not having to die and not being able to die is unfortunately not an option which can consistently be thought as a realistic option on the basis of a naturalist, non-dualist or imminent worldview and most transhumanists as well as I regard such a worldview as plausible. You just need to take a global perspective to understand this thought. Let's consider two options concerning the future of the universe. Option, option one, it will freeze and it will come to a total standstill. How should any uploaded human, human should survive such a state? Option two could be the collapse of a universe, such that the state of infinite density will be reached. Again, I do not see any realistic option of human, human survival. Hence, I wonder how human immortality could simply be thought on the basis of a naturalist worldview. Still, it does make sense using the concept of immortality for advertising a certain insight, namely the insight that an increase of our health span is in the interest of most human beings. Here, personal immortality functions as a utopia to highlight a specific insight, namely the importance for the duration of our health span. I think the most utopias in our cultural history had such a role. Philosophers such as Plato, Bacon, Marx presented utopias not because they thought that such a state can actually be realized, but in order to highlight some specific elements of our philosophical insights. Cryonics is another central transhumanist issue which is not in my main focus because I regard other technologies as more promising. Cryonics is a low temperature preservation of recently deceased organisms with the hope of their future revival. What is most relevant concerning this topic is the following thought. When you're dead and you're being buried, then you have no chance of being revived again. When you're dead and you're being cryopreserved, there is a chance of you being revived. Consequently, it can be reasonable buying this lottery ticket if you have a sufficient amount of financial means of doing so. These rather hesitant remarks are not meant to imply that AI, cyborg enhancement and automation cannot be expected to have a deep impact concerning the future. It is highly striking what can be done already. Deep brain simulation is incredibly useful to treat Parkinson patients. It's also very effective for treating severely depressed patients whose treatment by all other means was unsuccessful. The research by the engineer Kevin Warwick, from, formerly from the University of Reading in the UK, is particularly noteworthy. Let me just describe one of his fascinating examples. His brain was being connected to, to a computer via a non-invasive brain-computer interface while being in Columbia University, New York. The computer was linked via the internet to his computer at the University of Reading in the UK and there it was combined with a mechanical arm towards, with sensors at, at the fingertips. Warwick, while sitting in the US, was able to move the mechanical arm towards a table just by thinking about it. Having the right appropriate thought. So the mechanical arm with the censorship at the fingertips, and they, they moved to the table, the sensors felt the surface of the table, and the, and the feeling, the experience of sensing the table was sent via the arm, via the computer, via the internet, back to his brain, back to his brain, sitting in the US. Um, it was a risky uh, enterprise because it could have destroyed his brain. And he did not try this experiment with animals beforehand. However, it was successful and thereby revealed that humans and machines are not as different from each other as we used to believe. 
the future of education. All these developments are such that they are relevant for a great variety of fields within our life world. Education is particularly a relevant sector in this context. I've already explained that genetic and educational modifications are structurally analogous procedures. And that the relevance of gene analysis, in particular due to big gene data, can hardly be underestimated. Both will play a central role concerning the future of parental education. However, these developments also play a role concerning the future of the humanities, which ought to get transferred to something I'm referring to as meta-humanities. Humanities embrace dualist ways of thinking. Nowadays, non-dualist approaches become more and more relevant. The meta-humanities do not replace dualist with non-dualist approaches but promote an inclusive way of thinking by presenting dualist as well as non-dualist approaches. What this means becomes particularly clear given the birth and death of, of dualist media. The birth of dualist media occurred when the ancient Greeks invented the drama and performed them in newly created theaters. Dualisms were created in various domains. Firstly, a rigid separation between actors an audience was introduced, similar to the structure in, in that lecture hall. The separation was amplified and made more rigid by creating an architecture of ancient theaters with a rigid separation between these two groups of people. Thirdly, this way of thinking was amplified by introducing a separation between the protagonists on stage and the chorus. So further duality was introduced. So this tradition has continued during the history of media until the 20th century, and you can follow it in, in all minute, minute details. Um, one, of, one of the most, and um, until the 20th century, and now in the 20th, 21st century, when non-dualist thinking becomes more, more relevant. One of the most striking and fascinating and relevant examples is a metabody project directed by the Spanish artist and intellectual Jaime del Valle. I can't show that now, but if you're interested in, check out, for example, his Pan Gender Cyborg video. You find that on YouTube, Pan Gender Cyborg. Just look for it. Or you could also check out his some web pages associated with like metabody.eu or metahumanism.eu, meta m e t a metahumanism metabody. The ninth point, automation and the future of work. The relevance of all these developments even have an enormous impact on the future of work. Studies show that it's likely that half of the jobs we know today will be automized in 10 to 20 years from now. The consequences of this insight are enormous for economists, lawyers and politicians. Will we need to consider the option of introducing an unconditional basic income? I do not think so because it is dependent on political decisions whether people will lose their jobs or not. Still, it is an issue all of us will have to think about and take into consideration. The final point, technologies, is it a means or meaningful human activity? A widespread worry, which is particularly strong in the tradition closely connected to Heidegger thinking claims that it's dangerous to treat technologies merely as a means to various ends. Technologies ought to be a part of meaningful human practices. This claim leads to the demand that the basic philosophical com concepts which are dominating our political practice ought to be reformulated to generate a new way of meaningful thinking. Even though I can understand that worry, it's a claim I'm not sharing. I do not think that moving away from a system which is closely connected to freedom, equality, and solidarity is one which is in our interest. It's no move of which I'm in favor of. I think that a nihilism, in all its shapes, to be an aletheic as well as an ethical nihilism, is a wonderful achievement. Any attempt to overcome nihilism will create new kinds of dangerous and violent paternalistic structures. I think it's important to remember that we, as citizens of enlightened countries, live in a very special cultural realm. It is, it has not been like that during most other times of our cultural history. And it's still not the case in many countries today. 
1,000 years ago, the political and religious leaders had the right to decide according to which concept of the good citizens ought to live. During the Enlightenment, politicians, artists, scientists, inventors, and regular citizens were fighting for their right of living according to their very own idiosyncratic concept of the good. Thereby, the recognition of the norm of negative freedom, absence from constraint to live according to a certain concept of the good, was achieved. I'm happy that the norm of freedom has widely been recognized and accepted as a central achievement as it avoids morally problematic and violent ways of treating other people. It is a special, wonderful, and praiseworthy achievement, and I'm doing my best to show what an exceptional achievement it is. By considering freedom as a wonderful achievement, we will also be able to deal appropriately with all the future challenges we are bound to be facing. Many thanks for it.